Today we are uh, very happy to actually have with us uh, Josh Rosenthal. Uh, so before I introduce the speaker, let me say uh, maybe a few things about what we do uh, from the center. Uh, so we uh, are a relatively new center. Uh, we, in addition to, do, uh, to doing research in climate change, uh, we take uh, climate communication and climate education quite seriously. Uh, so we have our uh, undergraduate program in environmental science and sustainability that we started this semester. Uh, and we have been uh, organizing what we call the climate festivals uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, we uh, working for about a year, uh, we organize one festival, uh, climate festival, the last year we did, uh, Reverse of Life Festival. This year we just completed in November uh, Forest of Life Festival and next year we are planning to do Mountains of Life Festival. So we uh, bring in a lot of students uh, from you know around this area. We hire interns from all across India uh, to help them you know like, and encourage them to build the story. And so that's communication, uh, communication part uh, or you know like helping students to understand, to look at different components of, of the environment, not only with a negative view, but also with, with, with a view so that they can think about how they can, they can fix some of the problems, and also thinking about maybe a brighter future. And uh, as I said, we take climate communication quite seriously. Uh, we are going around the country working with journalists, and we have been organizing these data journalism uh, workshops uh, in different parts of India. So we just completed one year of that. And then we do webinars, uh, so, and then we do public talk series, among other things. So this is, this is part, of, uh, part of our activities, actually, communication activities. So I'm very happy to have Josh Rosenthal with us today. Uh, so he is a health ecologist and Fulbright column uh, climate scholar uh, for this year. And uh, he is a senior scientist at the uh, Fogarty International Center of the U.S. National Institutes of Health. And uh, currently he's, uh, he's just finishing up uh, your, your three and a half months month tenure, right, in, in, in Chennai. So uh, he has a long uh, standing interest in the integration of public health, uh, environment, and international development. And over the years, he developed and led uh, NIH research and training programs on environment and health in many countries around the world, including in India. Uh, so his recent work is, is focused on uh, primarily uh, on reducing household air pollution from cooking with solid fuels and on research programs to reduce the health impacts of climate change. During his uh, current Fulbright uh, Kalam Fellowship. Uh, he's working with faculty at Sri Ramachandra Institute of Higher Education Research in Chennai to create a new curriculum on climate change and health for public health professionals. So having said that, uh, welcome, uh, um, Josh, and please come on over and you know, we are eager to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, so what I would like to do is spend approximately about 40 minutes to provide an overview of the impacts we believe that climate change is bringing to public health and end with some, some thoughts about where we can go to address that. Um, now, the title of the talk is um, "Hot Public Health and Medicine in a Hot, Flat, and Crowded World is based on a book that I, that I like very much, also I like the title, um, by a uh, commentator, uh, sometime ecologist, uh, internationalist, Thomas Friedman in the New York Times, where he is looking at the global trajectory, this book is a few years old, and he's updated it a bit, but thinking hard about the global transformation that is ongoing, both environmentally, demographically, and economically, and how 
we um, must change uh, the way we behave, the way we run our economies to to survive, frankly. Um, so um, I'm going to start with crowded. Um, and this will be mostly things that you know at one level or another, but perhaps you'll learn a couple of things. So first, um, so I was born in 1959. And at that time, the world's population was about 3 billion people. Uh, so in the course of my lifetime, population has gone now to more than more than double to getting close to tripling. Uh, it's uh, at 8 billion now. And the UN predicts that by, um, you know, 20, 50s, 60s, it'll level out at around 10 billion, maybe closer to 11 the numbers. So um, it's a dramatic change in the density of people and uh, on the planet. Most of that growth has taken place uh, during that same time frame in China, India, and the continent of Africa. You'll see um, less growth uh, in Europe, Latin America and North America have grown slowly, but not nearly the same. Um, and if we look very locally here in Bangalore, um, the numbers are really startling. And of course, only perhaps a third of this growth from a million people in 1950 to uh, 12 to 13 million today um, is related to birth. A great deal of that is, of course, to immigration from other parts of the country and other parts of the world. But it is stunning transformation uh, of the planet. Now, by flat, um, what Friedman was referring to really was the hyperconnectivity around the world um, in several respects. Um, but one can, is illustrated here, and that is the fact that we can basically go from any point in the world to any other point in the world in less than two days by air travel. Um, that's really pretty much in the last 20, 30 years that you could move that fast that far. Here's a map of the 67,000 some odd routes of air travel connecting uh, 10,000 airports around the world, um, just to give you a sense of how extensive that connection is and how fast things, people can move. We not only move individually, uh, but we move in large migratory populations, at least in continuous streams. And um, of course, the traditional population centers, migratory pathways, uh, were to North America, Western Europe, Australia. Uh, but now in recent years, there's greater and greater um, migration to new, uh, see in the dark red, Mexico, parts of South America, South Africa, Eastern Europe, parts of India, elsewhere where I see these are now centers that are accumulating people. So globe migration is also expanding rapidly, but beyond the traditional um, uh, destinations. And then most strikingly is the um, volume of stuff and services that move around the planet now at remarkable speed. So this uh, is an index of world trade. If you say 1950, which is the prime period we've been talking about, if that index was at 100, uh, today it's, uh, you know, 4,500. So 45 fold increase in the volume of goods and services that flow around the world. So that is ships, containers, airplanes, uh, everything that you can imagine. And of course, we all use many of those things every day. Now, hot is the part of this uh, talk, and while I spend most of the rest of my time talking about climate change and its interconnection with these other uh, variables, but 
Um, and of course, this series is dedicated to climate change. And so appropriately enough, um, that's, um, I'd like you to take a look at this map, which is uh, from August, uh, the, the warmest August in history, as far as we know. This is a, a map shows the temperature anomalies by, by uh, degree centigrade. Um, uh, from the historical average from 1951 to 1980. And what you see is that, uh, in fact, it, while overall the planet's average uh, increased relative to that time is, uh, was it shown to about a, about a, a, a one degree now? Uh, but uh, in many places in the world, it's two to four degrees already, uh, at least that August. Of course, it's dynamic. This is, I find, here's Indus, India. And you will you might stare at that. If you have questions, we can talk about it later. But it's interesting that it's hot or here relative average and not so much uh, north in part of that plane. Um, and there, I think there's some interesting reasons why, but we perhaps could talk about it. Um, the implications of all this radical change across the planet is, of course, um, extreme weather, among other items. Um, and the IPCC 2021 report was flagged by the UN Secretary General as a code red for humanity. Um, and what we see is that the frequency and intensity, or the frequency of very intense droughts uh, rainstorms, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, wildfires, even freezes in some areas are, are increasing in time with devastating uh, consequences today, um, yet alone what's coming in the future. So to think a little bit more uh, directly about the relationship of climate change to health, um, um, I'm going to sort of draw a little pathway for you that may be helpful. So the changes that we think about with climate, so increased global temperature, weather changes, precipitation, sea level rise, changes in the weather conditions that for raising crops, then uh, are felt more directly in uh, heat, air pollution, water quality, dynamics of infectious and vector-borne diseases, changes in allergens, other things that more directly affect people, those then have measurable health impacts in um, uh, heat, uh, chronic diseases such as cardiovascular and stroke, of course, injuries, mental neurological, zoonotic vector-borne, and respiratory diseases, among others. So from a public health and medical standpoint, the question becomes, yes, climate mitigation is critical and we all need to be doing something about that. But you also need to think about what are the interventions that will allow us to be prepared for the inevitable changes that we're already seeing and are likely to get much more extreme. So strategies, and we'll talk a bit more about some of these in the latter part, but interventions and strategies that help us prepare ourselves and our communities from harm. The, the health effects in particular that people are focused on and that we find measurable differences um, related to climate change, there are, are coming both direct effects here on the left uh, heat, respiratory, food and water, injury, et cetera. And then indirect effects that are uh, effects that are um, uh, such as chemical release uh, releases, changes in air and water quality, population displacement, interruptions to healthcare services, poverty related infrastructure factors that have uh, sometimes very consequential impacts on human health. Those, that pathway is influenced and mediated by um, both um, environmental and social uh, factors. Um, this is one way to think about it. So if you look at top here, climate drivers and the health outcomes on the bottom, 
and they go through those exposure pathways that I talked about a slide or two back, um, the impact of all those are greatly mediated by land use change, geography, the agricultural production, um, in infrastructure in a town or in a, in a countryside, um, as well as the social and behavioral context that affect vulnerability of uh, people uh, to those um, pathways. And the health effects are also be very difficult to measure in a linear fashion because they are cross-sectoral. So the impacts of climate change can be felt, as I mentioned, directly on health, but often go through agricultural or economic transportation or environmental changes from climate that then impinge on health. And so these all interact in quite complex ways to um, uh, have, this is just using heat as an example of um, how that comes about. So let's talk a little bit about infectious diseases um, and why do infectious diseases become more, um, are of some, some infectious diseases are of concern because of climate change. Um, fundamentally, that the change in weather and climate changes uh, the, the um, ranges of both vectors and hosts for animals um, and allows those to migrate, it affects the transportation and suscept uh, transmission susceptibility of uh, both uh, the um, hosts and directly pathogens, and then ultimately affects the geographical spread of disease. If we think about zoonotic diseases, um, which are some of those which occur like COVID, with a, a very rapid uh, and sometimes unpredictable outcome, um, the, many of those are diseases that are, sp are spillovers from animals, uh, either uh, domesticated or wildlife, uh, that have a regular cycle there, but we don't notice them so much because there's a background immunity until they spill over into another animal, another host. And, but some of our most um, important infectious diseases, many of those are, both viral and bacterial diseases, reflect this spillover dynamic between the sort of uh, livestock, wildlife, and humans. And this interrelationship is now become, becoming um, its own management framework uh, as uh, one, one health where you manage the especially infectious diseases and all three of those sort of populations together. But not dependent on extreme weather, we can think about average changes also being ex uh, extremely important. So uh, 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, dengue, uh, which is a virus transmitted by a mosquito, Aedes aegypti, was very uncommon in India, or at least not well reported. Perhaps it's more common and not well documented than we know. But since then, there has been a steady increase to where it's becoming uh, of significant concern. In fact, a colleague of mine, one of her graduate students just died of dengue hemorrhagic fever um, just about two months ago. A healthy young man, just didn't take it seriously and uh, get to, caught up a bit very quickly. Um, and this is substantially related to increases in warm weather and, and, this, and water that is standing for longer periods of time. It's frequent rainfall that leaves puddles. And in urban areas are particularly susceptible because of where water sits in concrete and doesn't go. So it's twinned sort of increased urbanization and changes in climate are, are showing globally uh, an increased distribution of dengue um, in places where it didn't used to be. Uh, so another important dynamic that gets a fair amount of attention, I think, in the press here in India is the relationship to agriculture and to food, uh, with good reason. So with increasing droughts or just simply the disruption in the monsoons that 
support so much of the agriculture in India. You, but of course, around the world, this is happening as well. So production of food is changing um, quickly and losing large uh, crops to unpredictable weather patterns um, and of all sorts, from heat to rainfall and others. An interesting thing is not only is the production and therefore uh, scarcity food security uh, an issue, but the nutrient quality uh, appears also to be changing from a more direct uh, meteorological event, and that is increased CO2 concentration, uh, which is what plants take up. As they take up higher rates of CO2, it appears that the concentration of proteins and several nutrients, critical nutrients, is going down uh, in in concentration in food plant and so food plants and so we're starting to see some mineral deficiencies where we thought they should be at least calorie sufficient and therefore otherwise okay. Extreme weather events, as I've mentioned before, are growing uh, more common. Um, this is a map of five years um, uh, that shows. Uh, a series of extreme weather uh, events around the world, floods, droughts, cyclones, wildfires, ice storms. The ones in red are those which have been tied to climate change specifically. That is, they're attributable statistically to the deviation of climate from its historical averages. Um, so one of those extreme uh, weather events, um, wildfires is becoming a very uh, common problem in the United States. So uh, my wife and I grew up in California and we grew up with a wet season and a dry season. Now this year where there's a wet season from the last five years, a wet season, a dry season and a smoke season because the wild, wildfires take off through many of the forests uh, across the West, uh, Western United States and blanket much of the country with smoke, which of course is, um, for people, very bad to breathe, um, but uh, presents many, many other challenges. But interestingly, it's not just what happens locally. <clears throat> so on the top here, this last summer, there was a very, very serious spate of wildfires across Canada uh, for lots of historical reasons of multi-year droughts, um, and as you can see, um, those wildfires created um, air pollution that wasn't necessarily as big a problem in the West, but was in, uh, in the East Coast. So the smoke from the Canadian wildfires came down and created huge problems in the Northeast United States. So what happens far away can also affect people right nearby. Among the extreme weather events that are most devastating is floods. Uh, many of you are, have followed or at least are aware of the floods that uh, occurred in Pakistan last year, uh, where I think almost 40% of the country was underwater at one point. Extraordinarily devastating. Um, <clears throat> at least the references I found, over 100,000 people are displaced at least 1,700 killed, and still a year later, 8 million people, including 4 million children, do not have access to safe drinking water one year later. So it's devastating not only at the time, but there is a continuing uh, uh, impact on morbidity and mortality, as well as, of course, the economies. Um, Beyond those kind of direct effects, floods also, one of the things they do is distribute contaminants, toxic waste, um, hazardous waste, oil, uh, even things that are just in small concentrations that begin to be spread around the world. This is in, uh, in Texas, um, uh, where there was a, a large fire, or, uh, excuse me, a large flood, and there's been a lot of work by my organization to help sort um, out how to minimize that in the future. Um, and then, of course, when there are floods, people can't get to the hospitals. 
hospitals lose power, their their record systems are lost. Um, they can't physicians can't get and, and nurses can't get to the hospitals. Their supplies can't be there. Um, incredibly disruptive. In Puerto Rico, uh, five years ago, there was a major hurricane and floods. Um, five years later, it's still very difficult to get medical care on, on much of the island. So it's a, it's a long lasting, devastating impact. So um, I um, had uh, an opportunity very apropos for my time here in India to study climate change and health um, because I was in Chennai uh, in the, over the last couple of weeks um, and uh, got a firsthand look at, at a flood, extreme, extreme weather event and associated flood. Um, and so what I did was took that map that I showed a little while ago about the trans um, sectoral interactions between those and, and went through the news to see how that map reports about what was happening in Chennai just, you know, last week, a week and a half ago. Um, what we do know is that, uh, you know, at least 23 people have died. Um, it's probably much more than that. My colleagues at Ramachandra Hospital are saying there's a long queue at the cremation site across the road. So then we'll see what, what that looks like. It hasn't been studied yet. Um, but if you look through the newspapers, which I did, um, beyond the 18,000 people that displaced and the deaths from electrocution and trauma and drowning, uh, you have these other sequelae, infections, uh, mental health, depression, trauma, uh, and of course, food security, and people who can't get to the hospital have interrupted disease care for many reasons. So I sat down and I walked through this. And this is hard to look at, and I don't expect you to consume it all. But I just wanted you to notice that how well, if you map extreme rainfall onto that same pattern, you have massive power outages, flooded roads and, and tracks and runways. The, air, the trains weren't running. The, the airport was closed down. Those have enormous impacts, of course, on transportation and everything that depends on it, on the economy. Um, and those have then direct effect on healthcare um, and uh, uh, mobility. That's kids go don't go to school. Um, <clears throat> further, the 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 crops in the surrounding areas are flooded or are wind damaged. So farmers have lost enormous uh, amount of income. Food prices soar, so they're food insecure. Water, clean water will now be, of course, as you know, and I know there's a big dis dis uh, debate about the use of the exporting of water from Karnataka to, to Tamil Nadu, uh, but that's gonna happen again uh, next year. So, um, but further, the extreme rainfall caused sewage and waste overflows all over the city, uh, spreading toxic and infectious to waste, which then creates infections uh, and 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 uh, other toxic uh, exposures. Uh, hospitals are overloaded. The the you can't drink the contaminated water. The fishermen on the coast are now um, having a lot of trouble um, getting healthy fish because there's so much oil from a, a local oil um, container that's spread into the ocean that all the fish along the coast there have died. So um, in, important, my main point here is it, it looks pretty similar to heat, even though it's a radically different uh, in event. And the repercussions will be longer. Uh, it will take uh, longer to recover than probably from a heat event, although I wouldn't necessarily bet my salary on that, but my guess is yes, because of the disruptive nature of, of floods. So in that flood, um, you know, I was basically inconvenienced. Uh, you know, I was locked in my apartment without power and I had uh, no internet, which was pretty frustrating when I was trying to work. And I had to go to bed at eight o'clock at night because there was no light and there was nothing to do. <laughs> I couldn't read. So I was frustrated, um, but I had enough food, whether whatever it was I had in the kitchen, I ate, I had fresh running water, fine. Lots of people, of course, 
didn't, um, who were more than inconvenienced. And those people are the people that suffer with most social inequities uh, and environmental disturbances. Those who are underserved, uh, uh, impoverished, uh, low-income groups with health disparities. There are workers who are out there uh, and, and were exposed for various reasons, including people that were trying to uh, fix the electricity, um, uh, you know, were electrocuted. Uh, people with disabilities, of course, are stuck. If you're in a wheelchair and there's knee-deep water out in front of your house, you're, you know, you can't even trundle through it. Uh, of course, people that are elderly, young children, um, infants, uh, pregnant women, um, and then those with really severe um, uh, areas where they couldn't get access to their medicines. The number of stories about diabetes care uh, uh, lapses during that period. So half of the population of this country and of the world, in fact, is more vulnerable than the other half. On average, within within uh, classes and socioeconomic groups, because women tend to actually ha to have an extra burden for caring for the family, there, um, and they typically have unequal access and unequal power to make a difference to, to acquire the protection that they need, be it technological or mo or migration or whatever they need to do. So it's important to keep that in mind because women have a really critical role in maintaining communities and, and ensuring that we are resilient populations. So let's talk a little bit about resilience and some of the ways that we can fight back against these changes. Um, um, so interventions and strategies, if you will. Um, in the public health world, we talk about primary prevention, uh, secondary prevention, and treatment and management. So it's sort of in a biomedical public health management. If you apply that to the climate space, what you get is, of course, the first thing we need to do is stop global warming or slow it down as best we can. So reducing emissions, that's the long-term critical action that needs to be taken. Happily, that can be done in ways that are directly promoting of health. So uh, use of expanding and using green spaces, uh, and I'll go into a little more detail, as well as active transport, uh, uh, both reduce mitigation and uh, provide health to the people who are doing it. Secondary prevention. So these are the things that we're, we talk about as adaptation. What, what does society do? Well, at the, at the public health scale, of course, urban planning, water management, flood and sewer control. These floods would not be as serious if, if urban planning was done well, was followed through, was enforced. Um, that is a, it's a challenge. And in a country of the size of India, I'm, uh, and the scale of which these cities have grown, it's no surprise that it's been difficult to do. But it is key, urban planning. But you can say the same thing for, for farming, uh, water management in farms, crop selection, et cetera. Those large sales system changes are really important. And of course, the things that are important for public health everywhere, um, you know, disease surveillance, go back here. Um, disease uh, surveillance, vaccinations, et cetera, improve, important to protect your health, they're more important in the context of climate change. And many, many health interventions are like that. Is Climate is essentially a multiplier of existing vulnerabilities and threats. Um, but there are also very specific things that you probably have read about, with cool roofs um, <clears throat> and uh, early warning systems to know when extreme events are coming. Um, and now there's in growing uh, attention to how to deal with um, access to medical care and clinical services in remote uh, uh, challenge settings. So we think about <clears throat> a little bit back to this question about 
how mitigation and health benefits can go together directly, um, you know, reducing climate emissions by cycling is a great idea. Now, I showed this slide at Sri Ramachandra, and there was some snickering in the audience, right? Because this is not something you would see very many urban uh, settings in India doing, right? Because this is Denmark, um, or excuse me, um, Holland, Utrecht, uh, where they have a low density of population and really well-developed structure, low growth population. Um, um, but the point, though, that these people are actually, you know, lowering their blood pressure, reducing their blood sugar levels, um, and reducing their, their, you know, being able to manage their weight, increasing their respiratory capabilities by riding their bikes or walking to wherever they go. Um, and so what needs to be done to make that possible is safe pedestrian and cycling infrastructure, reducing automobile use and others. Um, and there's, the data is overwhelming that this produces direct benefits to people. Um, now, I recognize this is not what it's going to look like in India, but we can do better than that. <laughs> so, you know, this is urban planning that's completely um, obtuse, right? This is play, intentionally placing a long-term barrier to use of a sidewalk. Uh, nobody's going to walk through that, of course. So... We can, you know, by working, you can demand from cities that they begin to make infrastructural changes that might just be turning this thing sideways so you can walk around it. Uh, it's small things to make it easier for people to walk safely without getting hit uh, um, and, and to walk, period. Green spaces, I mentioned, there's um, overwhelming evidence that um, so I don't know if you, when you go to a law ball gardens or, or you see, you'll see lots of people out there, um, walking in the mornings. Um, it's no mystery why, right? I mean, people feel much better. The air's cleaner. Your blood pressure goes down immediately when you go into a nice, quiet, green space. So there's, and there's tons of evidence that re Green spaces in general, not in every case, but in general, reduce all-cause mortality, higher survivorship rates in cancer victims, uh, mental health, mental well-being, blood pressure, and also blue spaces, uh, if you will, where there's water and waterways, lakes that uh, here are plentiful in this region. If well-managed, they also facilitate water management to mitigate uh, disasters. Um, the adaptations, um, sort of individual housing, and there, there are hundreds of things that are being experimented with on now. Um, the one thing I will say is they're they're mostly going to be very useful. But do your homework if you're decided, for example, well, Bangalore is not going to probably be a market in the market for cool roofs. Uh, but in Ahmedabad, where this study was done, um, there was a huge difference between, you know, the the tin roofs there. This is overall heat. And and they put in a, a, a white, pa white painted roof, and it really didn't do much. And that is what is most often prescribed. It turns out that a concrete roof is actually really cooling. So... A little bit of research goes a long ways, either individually or institutionally, to make sure that uh, an adaptation is actually going to work. Sort of like vitamins, right? They don't work for every, all vitamins don't work for everybody. And uh, you need to do your homework to make sure they do any, any good at all. So my, this is my final slide and my final message. And that is, you know, governments, national governments, State governments carry the lion's share of the responsibility for large-scale events, whether that's mitigation of climate emissions, policies related to uh, uh, fuel use and, and 
and construction and agricultural subsidies, many, many things that drive climate emissions and many that drive public health. But we, as communities, in small groups and at, at a neighborhood level and at a larger level can be very impactful. And the movement in many parts of the world of these, you know, a university community or, a, you know, one that's organized by a neighborhood NGO, extremely impactive in changing um, you know, <clears throat> the safety and well-being of communities around them. You know, you know who are the populations at greatest risk in your community, um, where where those people are and what they need. And you know what your community will support and maintain. So it's just a plea to feel empowered and not defeat and expect the national governments to do to take care of it, to leap in there, roll up your sleeves, and work with the networks that you have to make a difference, protect yourselves and your families and your your uh, communities. Thank you.